So uh, this past week, I did a little bit of BTS filming for a photographer in England. He's actually been a guest on the podcast before. And the model that he booked to shoot um, on that occasion is actually a model that I'd worked with previously. And the time I worked with her previously, I think was 2016. And it was in Manhattan. It was a bit of a bucket list thing for me. I wanted to shoot in Manhattan and struck that off the list middle of a heat wave. It was probably one of the most painful experiences of my life, but I pushed through it just so that I could tick off an arbitrary bucket list thing before I eventually die in 2022 of COVID-7 or whatever it's going to be. And it reminded me how much I miss New York. I travel out there once a year and I haven't been able to do that for the last year and a bit. Last time I was there was actually January 2020. So I was there right as the COVID thing was starting to kick off. And I, I got this huge wave of nostalgia for New York. So we are going to include New York as a big part of this podcast for sure. But before we do any of that, let's start off with how you picked up a camera. What was it that made you want to be a photographer? Because obviously it's, a, it's an antisocial struggle. Everyone's a photographer now. So what made you want to be a photographer at the end of the day? Hmm. I mean, to be honest, I think it was kind of like more of a slow burn for me because I started out in um, fine art. And, um, that's really what I enjoyed to do the most, uh, like painting, drawing, um, alternative, you know, methods. And, um, I think someone had recommended I take a course and I was just like, sure, like, let's try this out. Um, and it just seemed to really click in a way, no pun intended, (laughs) but yeah, I just, I felt like it, it, it lended me, um, a way to integrate, uh, things that I loved about painting into photography. And the more I kind of learned about like, uh, alternative printmaking methods, I was able to kind of marry, uh, the thing that I kind of started in, in the arts into photography more. So, yeah. Well, I mean, you mentioned that it, it came later on in terms of your artistic approach, you were already an artistic person. You've your website. I mean, obviously, it's you doing your website, I'd imagine, unless you have a copywriter. And your website has you listed as a visual artist and photographer. So, do you not see yourself primarily as a photographer? Yeah. Um, I don't think I would. I mean, personally, I don't really care to be boxed in in any sort of way creatively. Um, and I think social media tends to box people in greatly visually as like what you should create and uh, stay within those lines. And I, I think if you have an artistic drive, like, um, you know, it's good to stay open, you know, explore different mediums and see how you can integrate them to one another versus, you know, staying really, really limited. What does photography give you that you're not getting from other artistic forms? Because I would say from a completely layman point of view, and I'm definitely not an artistic person in any other sense other than really music, photography seems like a much more direct visual art and a much more literal visual art than, than most other ones where it's more interpretation. Photography has interpretation, but obviously you're photographing something that exists, generally speaking. So um, it's much more literal. What's, what's the difference in the process for you? What does photography offer me? I don't know. I'd say like... The thing that I really love about photography in particular is it's very intimate or can be. And um, I really like, there's just like a very beautiful moment if you're with your subject. And ideally, I like to work with my subject one on one um, just because we're kind of able to like reach a point where like you drop whatever social facades you may have and just kind of interact with each other on a more intimate level. And I think that's what I love about photography is someone being willing to be open with me enough to kind of be willing to show their true self to me and let me document it. And um, I think uh, video can also lend that, you know, idea to itself but I think photography is and very unique in that way because it's such a um 
specific moment in time, you know, that somebody's like, okay, I'm going to trust you with this. I mean, it's very chronological. Like you say, it's very much focused on time and not just in terms of, you know, the time it takes to take the picture, but you're always kind of solidifying something in its own moment. Um, I know one of my favorite quotes, which I use quite often to to bash people that have uh, elitism when it comes to film photography, when basically what seems to happen is, so I'll just have a little moment to have a rant here, but basically what happens is people, especially in the last couple of years, they pick up film photography and they start off with like your standard 35 millimeter and then they move to medium format. And then sometimes they, they need to just keep going and going and end up with large format or, or whatever. Um, and they tend mm-hmm. to end up hating the, the, the means that got them into it in the first place. So they tend to kind of shit on 35 millimeter as being less of a, of a relevant piece because it's smaller and so on. And Peter Lindbergh, right. Peter Lindbergh has a quote about 35 millimeter being incredibly conversational in that you, you get lots of shots. You really get to kind of work through a process with your, with your subject. And like you said, kind of strip away the, uh, the outer layers of paint and get to the, to the real meat of the person as opposed to, something that's a lot more process orientated or a lot more technical. Right. Let's talk about like directorial style because I look at your work and I'm there's, there's, there's obviously a style, but it does feel like you're very, very adept at, at moving around your end product, the impact of your end product. You have stuff that's incredibly simplistic and beautiful, but you also have other stuff that seems to be incredibly conceptual. What's the, is there a difference in approach with the subject and with yourself when it comes to those more conceptual pieces compared to like sort of more standard, and I don't mean that word derogatorily, but the more standard fashion work? I don't know. I think sometimes I like to approach a project um, with a very uh, like strong concept in mind and uh, want to execute it to its end. And um, I don't want to say rigid, but I want to say more like stick to the concept and make sure you execute it. But then I also really enjoy being fluid with a subject. So if I book a model and just kind of want to do something casual, say like, um, come over, let's, um, let's just shoot, see where it goes. And I might have a few images as, uh, an idea of how I've kind of view or see them from their book, but all that can change in a, in a second based on like how you interact, what your vibe is, what their energy is like. And I think there's, there's just this real element of surprise and not like something really amazing and some really great images can come out of that. Sometimes it's a bust, but, um, I, I also love that, um, who knows what's going to come out of this today, you know? So I think I like to kind of do both. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like a chaos theory. You're looking for a spark that you can't necessarily plan for. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, you, you never really know. Um, and I think photography in particular is a lot like a dance, you know, mm-hmm. um, with your subject. And sometimes it's a really beautiful dance and you guys uh, understand each other. And it's kind of this moving artwork, you know, towards making something uh, beautiful. And sometimes it's a really awkward as hell uh, dance that just did not turn out well. <laughs> right. it, you know, it happens. Uh, so let's talk about, I mean, I, I'm fundamentally, because I'm English, I'm fundamentally miserable and uh, <laughs> I, fo- I focus very much on the negative side of things, but th- let's talk about the times it doesn't work. How do you, like, how do you gain from that experience? Like there's, there seems to be a bit of a, a thing I found with a lot of photographers where they, they don't want to walk away from a shoot with nothing. So even if photos don't really do anything to add to their portfolio, they're almost scared to discard them because you know, they spent time or, or whatever to sort of create them. Whereas I'm much more, I think because I'm part German, I'm much more keen to just get rid of stuff that I'm not using and, and it's not of any use to me. I'm a lot more cold like that. So how do you take something from a shoot that hasn't gone well? I mean, I think mentally, emotionally, you know, failure is kind of our greatest teacher. Um, so anytime 
things haven't turned out how I wanted. Um, I'm just like, okay, well, what do you want to do different or better the next time? Like, how can you uh, improve upon this or where, like, where did it go wrong? What do you like about it? Um, And then as far as like how I actually, um, I guess, organize my work later, I tend to, I'd say probably every couple of years, I do like a mass... (laughs) destruction where I'm just like, Oh my God, I hate this. And then throw out a bunch of things. And it feels very cathartic because sometimes I've held on to things that I thought were really great. But in hindsight, I'm like, you know what? I think it's time to like, you can release this. And it feels really nice. Like you're able to move far forward visually. One thing I have learned from doing this, this is I'm pushing towards the 170th podcast and I spend a lot of time every day, regardless of podcasts, I'd spend a lot of time speaking to photographers and I'm going to, I'm going to make a, uh, a generalization here. So I know that's like the most anti 2021 thing to do, but I have found on the whole that female photographers are much more keen to not present a negative side or not present a, or not, not necessarily present, but not necessarily, uh, they don't like to dwell, let's say, on the negative side of things when they haven't worked out. If you have a shoot and you, like you said, you have this, like you're going for this chaos theory, theory spark, you're looking for something that's going to really create something new and wonderful out of the, out of the mix of the personalities and the, and the dance, as you put it, of the shoot and doesn't work out. Do you put that down to maybe? it just being you and that person and then not work with that person again? Or do you put it, how do you sort of file that when it comes to a a failure with someone? Because if I fail on a shoot with someone, then I tend to be kind of opposed to working with them again, because I feel like there might be a, a clash of personalities or something. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it is that, and it's unfortunate when you put a lot of time and energy and money into a shoot. And, um, if it's not somebody or a team you've worked with before and it just really doesn't work out, it's, it's of course really disappointing, but you know, you learn and you're like, okay, well, you know, that didn't go so well with that person. And, you know, we're just on different wavelengths and kind of better, better luck next time. Um, I, I think I try at least for any sort of shoots that I'm going to invest in um, with a more serious concept or or financially that it be team members that I've worked with on some front professionally so that I kind of know what I'm getting into. And there isn't that uh, hurdle to get over because I think there's a lot of loss in time and can be very unpredictable in like, if you're trying to execute a concept and no one's really worked with each other before, you could have a real push pull on like, you know, if there's a lot of egos on set and, um, you know, that's just, if it can be avoidable, I try to. Something that kind of is, is weird because it's a juxtaposition. It almost feels like a catch 22 is that as you get better at something you you're generally speaking your standards for yourself go up and up and up which is why most people that have gotten really into something creatively tend to become more and more miserable because they're more and more focused on what isn't working and they want to tighten up every little screw and make sure that everything is pushed towards the exact vision that they have in mind because they're more capable of reaching that whereas obviously like earlier on you're just happy like i remember when i first started photography i was just I was usually just relieved to either take the lens cap off or not forget the card or something. When that's going up, you also have the other side of things, which is that you can uh, become almost disillusioned with the direction that you're going in based on what's going on around you. So like you can be influenced by the people that are coming in to be photographed and then that can actually pull you away from your very tight vision because you're working with people that are also very focused on their own idea of what they want to be portrayed as or how they want to be portrayed or the projects that they want to do. How do you, how do you balance, you know, especially like you said, something so intimate where there's two people, how do you take charge of that and make sure that you're taking away what you want? I would say if you have a very strong concept in mind, a lot of that needs to be like 
those kinks need to be worked out in pre-production because if you arrive at a shoot day of and suddenly there's like a ton of push and pull on creative vision, um, it's just sort of a recipe for disaster. So uh, usually if, if I'm, I'm coming into a project with like a, a concept in mind, um, I might pitch it to a stylist, hair and makeup and be like, what do you think about this? Is this something you like? What are your thoughts? Like, so that we can kind of all, before we arrive that day, feel like we're on the same page of what we want to accomplish. Um, I think where I've noticed things sort of falling apart is where new members maybe had to have been brought into a shoot that like say a team member had to work on something else and had to bring in someone else. And then that's where you kind of get that, uh, that messy, like, I'm not sure if this person's on board, you know what I mean? So, right. um, I think if, if those things can be fixed in pre-production, um, and get everybody on the same wavelength, then that's, that's ideal. Um, but yeah, I think, I think also being a uh, fluid on a shoe and not being super restrictive, like open to other people's ideas, Mm -hmm. uh, what they're thinking. But ultimately, like if, if you're leading a creative vision, you also have to be, be firm in your vision because you will encounter a lot of, uh, a push for other people to make it their vision. You know what I mean? Yep. Something I have noticed looking through, especially your conceptual work, and there's, there's some some absolutely wonderful stuff in there, but something that has really stood out to me is the the leaning towards more anonymous images. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, to me, it feels like it's very like portraiture, fashion photography, so much um, people photography since seems to focus on expression through literally facial expressions and and reading people's facial expression. And you have several collections of images conceptually that are more about removing that side of things and it being more interpretable down to like body parts um and and more angular geometrical things you know introduction of props textures and so on is it i've never done conceptual photography at all and i don't have the imagination for it for sure but this is something that can be a hard sell because obviously some people i feel like might be quite focused on you know, it being recognizable that they're the person in the photo when it comes to showing it in their portfolio? Um, well, to be honest, I usually use myself for that. So I don't have to sell it to anyone. I just do it. <laughs> I see. I see. Yeah, I'd know that if it wasn't anonymous, you see. Uh, so that's any, a lot of times if I'm, if I'm doing any sort of, if I have an idea that is going to be like very grimy and requires like, I don't know, climbing in a dirty tree in the dead of winter. I will only subject myself to that. I would never, (laughs) I I just like, I feel like it's inhumane to ask someone else. And uh, so, yeah, I've I've usually used myself for the dirty work and those sort of projects. Um, And cause yeah, I think sometimes It can be, it would be very hard to explain um, some of these concepts uh, without visuals. And, you know, sometimes they just sound totally crazy um, until you make it. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, for sure. But so let's talk about that then. How did you, because I feel like that's going to take a lot of courage to step in front of the camera. I mean, I suppose the actual shoot process could be much more comfortable because you're you're dealing with a photographer that you know you can trust because it's you. But how did you go about the first time that you decided to do self-portraits and, and how do you find it now? I don't know. It was like, it was kind of always a means to an end for me. Like, um, it started in college and, um, I didn't have any connections to model agencies and I was much too timid to even consider that an option. Um, and we'd have projects and I, I was like, oh, I have this really cool idea. Like, how am I going to execute it? So just use yourself. Um, And so, yeah, that's how it started. And that's kind of what I've 
continued with on any sort of more my obscure ideas that I feel like maybe models may feel uncomfortable with or um, really I would feel uncomfortable suggesting them to do because like anything that requires getting in dirty water or freezing stuff like that. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to subject anyone to. I mean, it's, it's admirable of you. I think that there's, I think there's probably a fair portion of photographers that are more than happy to take a little bit of uh, indirect spiteful anger out on subjects through doing stuff <laughs> like that. So it's very admirable of you to do it that way. Um, having been on both sides of the camera, then how do you go about, sort of selecting your models and and what is it to you that makes a great model? I'm not sure. I feel like when I'm looking through, uh, you know, different agencies for someone, I usually have an idea or emotion, a feeling that I want to convey. And um, I look for people that have like a very... um, something beyond like just being beautiful. Cause there, I mean, we're in New York, there's millions of beautiful women. Um, but I think to like really captivate an emotion that is something that would resonate with a total stranger online, there has to be like a, a real element of, of honesty and like trueness in uh, their eyes and their expression. So that's the sort of energy that I look for, but, um, it's not always something that, you know, I succeed in capturing. So it's sometimes successful, sometimes not. If I could just backtrack a little bit, then let's talk about these conceptual images and the inspiration for them, because we see the destination, but we don't see the journey and how the idea came about. And uh, where are mm. you finding your inspiration for one? And I, I guess a second sort of follow-up question would be, how often do these things sort of come through the way you expect them to, or do they take on a bit of a journey of their own? Um, to be honest, like I feel like my mind is a bit of a furnace with ideas and concepts that I want to do. And it can be really tiresome because I can't, um, execute them as fast as they're coming. So I have a lot of books and journals and notes of all these like, uh, visuals that I have in my mind that I want to make a reality. Um, so that can come all the time, I would say, um, for conceptual work that I have executed, um, a lot of, my most recent work I would say is, is really very personal. They've been like my, my own, uh, personal journey, things that I've experienced and, um, art and photography, whether that's, uh, it really doesn't matter. The medium, um, helps me process those emotions, any experiences, um, because I help, I I think it helps make, what you're feeling internally, an external visual thing that that becomes tangible and allows me to uh, be able to release it once I, I've, I've put it into a 3D world. And with regards to myself, I do weddings and I do sort of like portrait fashion work and they're very, very separate entities. And something that I do quite often is I use one to offset the other. So if I'm finding one to be a bit of a creative frustration, then I, I do something with the other to kind of remedy that. And it keeps my mind fresh. It keeps me, um, especially technically, it keeps me technically interested because I think unlike a lot of, a lot of male photographers, I'm actually not that interested in the technical side of photography beyond making sure that it's a means to get what I want from it. You do more. I don't want this, any of this to sound uh, like I'm putting anything down because I promise you I'm not but you do more simplistic work and you do more conceptual work. Do you, do you use the simplistic work to offset the conceptual work? Is it, does, does one help inform the other or are they just two things that you do that I'm completely reading too far into? Um, I think more simple portraits is in part, uh, I would say a requirement to maintain relevance in New York fashion 
um, just to keep your book updated. Um, I also think it's, it's a good practice as a photographer because if I stay working only in like conceptual stuff and never really exercise those muscles of unpredictable elements, um, when you're put into a group shoot, you're not going to be able to react, um, as well, if that makes sense. So I think it keeps, it keeps me on my creative toes, so to speak. If I, uh, don't do something conceptual and kind of throw it up in the air to the photography gods <laughs> be like okay let's just see how this goes like maybe we'll make some great portraits maybe this will be trash but like let's just see how how it all plays out um so i think uh yeah i would say the more simple portraiture stuff like that is more creative exercise uh of not being tied to an idea um and um, I think it lets me, I think it lets me be a little chaotic instead okay. of going in with like, I have this idea, this is how it's going to look. And, uh, that's much more restrictive. Is it the case that one makes you happier than the other? Um, I love making weird art. <laughs> I think, I think it's really fun like I I I admire artists um like David Lynch a lot because he's willing to try the most absurd off the wall weird shit and uh sometimes it's great sometimes it's not so great but I think it's really important to like always exercise those muscles and it can be really hard to get people on board for weird things but I think it's important for our artists to do that because if we just sort of always paint within the lines, no one's going to really be forced to like think differently. So do you think that there's a, an element of, I mean, I'd, I'd certainly say there's an element of people being afraid to fail. So they never, so that basically like there's a, there was a way that this was said to me before, which was like, most people, when they're rolling a dice, are happy to get a three. And if they always got a three, then then they'd be satisfied. And then there's people that are fine rolling a one if there's a chance they could get a six. There's like two different yeah. types. People are like happy being very, very much like average or just above average or just kind of creating, especially creatives. It seems like a weird thing for people to be reserved as a creative. But is it the case that you think some people are just afraid to to roll a one so they'll never roll a six? Yeah, I think there's, there is that fear. Um, But I think, I don't know, personally, the way I approach, I don't think just life in general is that I would rather, I I fear not trying than I actually am afraid of failure. Right. Because like, yeah, I, 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 failed so many times like this is what it means to be any sort of creative person or just a human in general you're going to fail it's inevitable but it's how how you learn how you grow how you can um find your real voice but if you always stay playing it safe and kind of catering to the masses of like what other people say this is good photography or this is good art. This is like what's cool on Instagram right now. Then you're always going to kind of be sounding like someone else. And I would rather take the risk of like sounding like myself and everyone hating it (laughs) than being really good at being someone else. I mean, when I look at your work, something that that jumps out to me compared to a lot of a lot of other people that I have interviewed is, is there's a lot of people that have a very, very distinct style in terms of color or black and white. They tend to, you can see a bias one way or the other for sure. Mm-hmm. With yourself, I don't see a bias as much. And I'm just curious when you know an image should be a black and white image compared to, to compared to color. I don't know. I think 
I think I'm guided a lot by um, the emotion of an image. And when I'm working on something, um, usually when I'm shooting it, I, I'll know whether or not it should be in color or black and white. It rarely, I would say, happens in post. It's just sort of that moment where, you know, maybe a model's under red light or it's a very warm feeling or maybe a feeling of dusk um, that I'd want to maintain how that light is affecting the overall shape of the image. Um, and sometimes, you know, if the light is just very, very beautiful and the, the shapes on our skin or overall um, is better in black and white, it just, I don't know, I, maybe I'm just guided by like intuition of, of when I'm shooting. Um, but yeah. And another element of your work that, that sets you apart, it feels like there's a real um, important component in texture for for a lot of people, it's you know they're focused on subject, on expression, and so on. It does feel like texture plays a huge role, and I feel like maybe that's part of the uh, alternative printmaking side of things. For for people that that wouldn't know, people probably like myself, explain what you mean by alternative printmaking. Um. So in college, I was I was really lucky to study um, with. Um, Sarah Van Curen. So she's like one of the last people that uh, does gum bichromate printing and palladium and all these really old photo methods. Um, and they also shared with us some like modern digital printmaking methods. And I just, I really fell in love with it. It was one of those things where like, I think, you know, as an artist, like when when you lose yourself in doing something and you're just like in a total flow state, that's what you need to be doing. Um, and so that's, I guess where I fell in love with uh, a new aspect of photography because I felt like it furthered the expression. Um, like you said, very textural, which I think is important. Um, I think in anything I make, I want to convey something to a viewer, whether it's like an emotion or a thought or an experience. And I think texture is a really great way of, of making that more tangible. It's definitely an idea when it comes to people that are, uh, are like yourself, very ima- uh, have a very big, vivid imagination that there's the potential to be more of a tortured artist in the sense that you, you, know, you <laughs> oh, yeah. have... To- you have all these ideas and like you said that they're they're all coming out and and you almost haven't got time to execute all of the ideas that you have that you might not ever be satisfied because you're never really reaching the destination and and I think that that's a matter of perception more than it is necessarily that you can't be happy in that sense I think a lot of people focus more on destination than journey and journey sometimes is a significantly bigger part of of what you're doing so I guess it sounds like a probably quite a philosophical question. I do apologize, but does, does photography make you happy? Yeah. Um, I think I wouldn't really know any other way of being really without not just photography, but any sort of creative expression. It's, it's, um, really how I've been able to process my thoughts, feelings, emotions, experiences, and make sense of it is just um like integral to my person and um I think you're absolutely right like um I think it's easy to get really focused on where you want to arrive but in that mode of thinking you'll never really be happy upon that arrival because you'll always be seeing like the next mountain and the next mountain um and I've I think Printmaking in particular has taught me patience because I've gotten very impatient where I want to get to the next destination. And it's a really time intensive process and there's a great deal of imperfection and you cannot make something perfect. 
Um, so yeah, it's taught me to like be patient that life's a process and it's going to be messy. It's going to be imperfect. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. No, definitely. You, you mentioned quite a bit ago about how there's, there's millions of gorgeous girls and, and guys in New York and the, the option there to photograph these beautiful people but you have to find the ones that are the most expressive. I have a couple of questions about that. New York, I imagine it's quite an intimidating place because everybody's very ambitious. So I feel like there's the potential to kind of be swallowed up by other people's ambition and and not really get out of your shell because you're so intimidated by the people around you who are probably also masking a certain level of, of insecurity themselves. New York as a, as a place to live as a creative, how, how much help is that? for you to be able to do what you do and and the follow-up would be new york as a subject is is it somewhere that constantly inspires you just organically with you being there no i wouldn't say i am um i think but i think in some way any artist needs to have some sort of friction between themselves and the place they live like i feel like most famous authors or artists had, had a bit of a problem <laughs> with where they live. Right. Um, not that I find New York like miserable or unhappy, but I don't, I wouldn't say I draw inspiration from there. I don't, um, I'm not like, Oh wow. I want to go photograph the Brooklyn bridge. Um, it just doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, it certainly has an energy though, New York. I mean, I go there every, every January that it's legal. And, um, I, I find maybe not necessarily like landmarks and the obvious stuff to be inspiring in that sense, but more just the sort of, uh, the, the energy of the city in, in the sense that it kind of, it's one thing I love about New York and I, you, you definitely don't get this in England is that you have the opportunity to be just completely anonymous. Like everyone else is doing something and they do not give a shit that you're there. So you have that opportunity to have the pressure taken off of you in that sense. And I just wondered if that's something that, that maybe inspired you, because I guess as an outsider, it's something that inspires me purely because it's very much different from where I am. And actually my, my first question was just about, do you ever feel swallowed up about, by the, the sort of raging ambition that seems to be around places like New York or LA? No, I think, um, I think that's something and probably one of my, like, I would say is a greatest lesson an artist can learn or photographer or whatever you're doing really is, is learning how to like turn your blinders on. You know what I mean? Like when horses have those blinders on the side of their face, because the moment you start like assessing what you're doing to, well, this photographer is doing this, or this artist is here, or, you know, I really like their aesthetic and I want like all of those things that start running through your head is like, you're losing yourself. And that's, that's your, your greatest asset is that nobody has your vision or your, uh, ideas, uh, your voice. So that's like, number one is, is staying completely focused on your path and not being distracted by what's like popular on Instagram right now or what your colleague is doing. Um, because I think if you're looking at someone else's path, that's, that's the moment you're going to start tripping. Um, I think New York's definitely made me channel some real inner focus. Um, I think the energy here is really great because it's, it's kind of like a furnace, um, very, very driven, uh, unpredictable and weird. And I love that about New York. Um, I can go outside and see two guys driving a car souped up to look like the Mario brothers. Like there's always really (laughs) random weird things that you're just like, this only happens in New York. And I, I love that, that, strangeness because you won't see that in Paris it's you know Paris is very sophisticated and is you know a really lovely mental escape but um 
I think New York has this real gritty authenticness that I love versus LA, uh, they'll tend to soften the blows. <laughs> it, it, it feels very fake. And I, I, I like that about New Yorkers where it just be like, I hate you, like get out of my face. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I do remember, um, one of my first trips alone to New York, uh, I'm wandering around at like two o'clock in the morning, photographing various empty streets or as empty as they were going to get. Um, and I was wandering back to my hotel, which was in, uh, which was row, which is like sort of, I think just a bit West, like one block West of, uh, Times Square. And I was walking through like the, the theater bit. And I was actually next to a big sign for the waitress when three guys surrounded me and I won't go into the whole story because there was some stuff said that it's not particularly pleasant, but they were, I think, angling to mug me. And mm -hmm. when I started to speak, the the look on their face was so funny. And um the one of the three said, damn, I'm not gonna do the accent because it would be horrendous, but <clears throat> the guy said, damn, this guy's British. Um I'm not robbing a gay guy and walked off. <laughs> And I was like, that oh feels like God. the most New York thing that could have ever happened was like, I've been insulted and let off of a mugging in the space of like one <laughs> second. <laughs> totally. I think um, in New York, like number one, I always keep headphones in. I have sunglasses on me. Like you have to master the space of like, I will wreck your day if you mess with me. Mm. I keep keys on a chain on my pants because some guy tried to like rip my purse off me once. So there's like lots of fun little New York adaptations. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh you do get a similar thing in, in, in London, but it's a lot lower energy. They usually can't be bothered to rob anyone because everyone here is poor. So they'll just stab you and walk off. Oh God. <laughs> so on the subject of, of, uh, <laughs> on the subject of separating people by like I was for having a, a, a quote unquote British accent, which by the way, when you're from England is the funniest, like, it's like saying that someone from Alabama has an American accent. It's like, it's a very, mm. very broad sense of something very specific. Um, but on the subject of kind of dividing people for the sake of dividing people, there's a, there's a common misconception or myth or i think in some cases it can be true and i actually don't think it's a negative um in the way that it's kind of portrayed by some people but there's a there's an idea that female photographers are less technically focused they're more focused on on other sides of photography the, the sort of the the human side of it the emotion the expression um and mm -hmm. more the impact of the image as opposed to I think it's more the case that just there are a lot of men that are way too focused on the technical side of things and tend to take photos that have zero impact, but they can zoom in on and tell you how good they are. <laughs> Do you, uh, I always say on workshops, people that show you a histogram to tell you their photo is good are, are losing the battle. Oh, that's uh, are, you, true. are you someone that sees yourself as a particularly technical photographer? And do you think you have to be to create good work? No, I mean, I, I worked in a daycare and we had like given out disposable cameras to little kids and some of them took remarkable photos. Like you can be a five-year-old and take an iPhone photo. That's like, well, that's incredible. Um, but um, I think for me professionally, I had to learn a lot of very, very technical things in terms of lighting and cameras um, and, um, I think what's, what I started as is, uh, more creative, like, uh, focused on like the overall, like emotion of an image, uh, professionally to like actually be hired for jobs. Like you have to have a certain level of expertise. Um, otherwise, you know, they would have just hire their cousin to shoot it with an iPhone. Yeah. I just think it's, um. I think I, I like I, I speak especially for America here. Um, there's a lot of focus on like people's identity and and boxes that they can be put in, and then it's all very very counterintuitive to the end goal, in my opinion. But so be it. But there, there are actually a lot of positives to 
people's differences. I think if we eliminate all differences from people, we're kind of taking away from what different types of people and different different identities bring to a table. Um, and one of those I do think is is that I mean I've seen it for sure is that that there are people and it's not necessarily down to female or male or anything like that, but there are creative people that bring amazing impact and they can really touch someone with a piece of work, but they might not technically be able to explain it in in any sense. Yeah. So they kind of just followed a line of trying things until, you know, the Rubik's Cube started to kind of solve itself. And there are other people that that are like infinitely knowledgeable when it comes to every single aspect of of how a camera operates and and the lighting and, and everything else. And they just end up with something that is very polished and and fine but it's not right. going to have any kind of impact on people and obviously it's always great to find that balance but you see a lot of music as well where there, there's music that's incre- incredibly imprecise but generates huge emotion and generates huge following and then you have other kinds of music which is very precise and technical and so on but people just don't resonate with it as much so Right. Uh, for for the sort of roundup, I don't want to take too much more of your time. I do really appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this. How much of a of a, an influence on you, or how important is your audience feedback for for the work that you're doing, or is are you looking to just satisfy your own like your own opinion? I guess. I mean, I think ultimately, I would I would love to make work that resonates uh with people in a way that um is connected um but i would also be really happy if it never resonated with anyone because it's it's like my place where i can be free you know it was it was like my escape as a child it's been my escape like all throughout my life is to like, where can I put these ideas, these emotions, these experiences? Um, So I think end of the day, like why work that may be kind of messy or chaotic and less technical can tend to resonate is because it's like coming from a place of like just pure expression and kind of like throws caution to the wind and it's just like this it's it it's more coming from a raw internal place versus like uh trying to achieve some form of like human perfection which is kind of inherently a lost cause the wonderful sounds of new york during your sentence to a close <laughs> there that was wonderful <laughs> yeah. okay let me ask you one more question and i will let you uh, enjoy an evening of not listening to me talk. Oh, you're lovely. So let's talk about your your body of work, and you have what I would I would describe as maybe erroneously, but you have projects. You have small subsets of images within your broader scheme of just all of your work put together. What about things like photo books or or things like that? If you have any, do you have any interest in releasing? Uh, like a book of conceptual imaging or, or, you know, I know they can't be released, I guess in their original mm. form, but like uh, your, your alternative printmaking, something that would be like a tangible piece of art for people to get their hands on. Is that something you would be interested in? I don't know if in terms of a photo book, um, but what I'm been working on for this last year is, um, would be for more of like an exhibition um series of prints um so that's i i don't think i want to give up fashion or beauty photography completely um because they're both things that i really love but yeah i would absolutely like to integrate um my work into more of like a tangible um selling prints um canvas things like that like some more one-of-a-kind pieces i just definitely see the the possibility especially with the fact that you have these collections i'm going to try and talk you into it now this is just me trying to sell you on an idea um because i'm a i'm an absolute uh, obsessive when it comes to photo books that 
I feel like there's definitely scope. I'm again, I'm just trying to talk you into it. Take this as a really hard sale. <laughs> Because individual images are obviously great, but having a collection of images where it kind of you get that Kuleshov effect of you understand more of the interpretation of the whole project by seeing more than one uh, one image from it. I think that that's something that's definitely something I would, if I were you, I would consider because I really like that British guy that's suggesting it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think it could be really lovely, especially maybe more for like portrait work. I think that would probably lend itself well to seeing like a larger body versus uh one print at a time Mm -hmm. um i've also considered um making like a book series of like before every shoot i have to take a like a color test with my assistants so i would just i think i would at some point just like a collection of all those photos because they're (laughs) usually really goofy (laughs) that sounds like a pretty cool idea yeah. Again, taking up way too much of your time. You've been far too kind. The most important thing and the whole purpose of the podcast is to draw people's attention to your work. So website, Instagram, where's the best place for people to see what you do? Um, just my name. So it's Kate Kelly um, on Instagram or katekelly.com. And that's it. I would definitely give people the spelling. Oh, C A I T. K-E-L-L-Y. There you go. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you.